Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing archaeological research as a key to understanding our past with special guests, Dr. Letitia LaFollette, president of the Archaeological Institute of America in Massachusetts, Dr. William Doley, president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest in Arizona, and Dr. Deborah Carlson, President of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology in Texas. So thank you all for joining us. You archaeologists are storytellers, you're, you're detectives, you're scientists, you're social, uh, sociologists, uh, art historians. Um, but I think the thing that really does resonate with me uh, are the stories that I've learned from your work and from, from the work of your colleagues. Um, if, if it were not for archaeological research from amateurs or professionals, we would never have the context for um, for Homer's great um, uh, works uh, talking about the Iliad and the Odyssey and the destruction of, of Troy. We wouldn't really know uh, about the founding of our own country and the multiple stories uh, there. We wouldn't understand the threads of history. So I, I'd like to, you to start, uh, Letitia, in terms of the archaeology, uh, Archaeological Institute of, of America, what what do you do? What do your members do? And, and what are you trying to advance in our society as a message about the importance of archaeology? Thank you, Mark. Well, that's a, that's a great question. So the AIA was founded in 1879. Um, it was chartered by Congress in 1906. We have over 200,000 members um, in uh, a hundred, over 100 local societies in North America. Um, so we have a, a small group of professional archaeologists who are primarily based in the Mediterranean, although not exclusively. So their work is done in the Mediterranean. I myself am a, a Greco-Romanist, so I worked both on the Acropolis of Athens, um, on a building there, as well as on a, a Roman bath complex on the Aventine Hill in Rome, which was buried underneath a, a Principessa's Palazzo, so a Roman princess's um, house. Um, and I'm currently working on a group of um, Roman marble portraits that were smuggled out of Rome at the end of the 19th century and wound up in Copenhagen. Um, it's one of the only family groups we have um, of the period of I. Claudius, basically, um, of the first century. So uh, the AI has, uh, its motto is excavate, educate, and advocate. Um, and we Work on, we support archaeologists' work, um, their, both their field work as well as their um, post field work. Um, we give a number of gra grants um, and fellowships out to working archaeologists as well as graduate students. Um, we also host an annual conference. Um, and we really work at the second piece of, about educate. We work to educate the public about the importance of archaeology. So we have a national lecture program, which is open and free to the public. Um, it's if, if people are interested, um, you can Google National Archaeology Hour, the National Archaeology Program. Um, and um, we also have a, a conference called Archaeocon every spring that's for kids and their families. Um, and then the third piece really is to advocate for archaeology. Um, and so we have a site preservation program that has actually supported 33 sites on five continents. Um, we believe very strongly in the importance of community engagement around archaeology. Um, and um, uh, we're currently actually raising emergency funds to support um, archaeologists in areas of conflict. So like in Ukraine and um, places like that. So let me and stop Bill, for a second. And, yeah. and Bill, you're, you're doing your research with civilizations that are as ancient um, as the ancient uh, Greek uh, civilizations of which we know a lot more. Uh, talk a little bit about about that aspect of your of your work and and why that's so important to understand what's going on in in Arizona and how the history has evolved there. Even the history that we only see through uh, carvings or images uh, on, on the side of rock, because that particular culture didn't necessarily carve marble statues and portraits. So I'm based in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Archaeology Southwest uh, was founded in 1989. And we, <clears throat> our offices are on the homelands of the Tana Autumn and the uh, Pascua Yaqui. And we work across the entire U.S. Southwest and, and Mexican Northwest. 
and uh, again, landscapes that are homelands to a diverse uh, set of tribes and, and communities. So in that, um, I just want to underscore that we focus on what we call preservation archaeology. So that's a, it's a <clears throat> holistic conservation-based approach where we explore and protect um, important heritage places, and but also recognize their um, diverse values to um, different communities. So our work, um, I mean, one of the examples that I'd like to highlight in terms of our um, long-term research efforts has been to look at uh, a major migration out of the Southwest Four Corners area and where people had been long established in that area. And we <clears throat> have been invested over two decades in, in this research. And so some folks went maybe 50 miles, others as, as far as two, 200 miles uh, into the, the Southern Southwest and asking questions about, um, you know, <clears throat> why did people leave a homeland that, that was, um, you know, long established? Uh, how did they make, uh, you know, relation, develop relationships with the people that were already living in the places they moved to? And how did they uh, deal with conflict and, and those kinds of issues? So um, focusing on the material items um, that are in the, the past migration is a pretty difficult thing to document oftentimes. Um, and <clears throat> also working with modern uh, descendant communities is a really important part of taking the material uh, evidence of archaeology and, uh, you know, applying a lot of the great new techniques that we've developed over time. And though having deeper discussions with tribes whose memories go back um, well into, into the past. So the idea of collaboration, respect for tribal knowledge, that archaeologists aren't just telling someone else's history, um, it's a collaborative process that uh, we try to prioritize. So, and there's so um, few, there's so few faint clues, right? And there's so many different theories. There are theories about uh, uh, a, a drought. There are theories about um, the the uh, the lack of crop rotation. There are theories about uh, the, the religiously based uh, theories. We're we're trying to find this sense of why people left in part to inform how we think about today, because a lot of those lessons might be applicable today, right? Well, I, I want to um, jump on one of the, the why people left phrase there. Um, so much of the stories that archaeologists often propagate um, kind of give the impression that people are no longer um, on the land. And I think that's one of the things that they may have moved. They may have, um, you know, maybe the material remains they leave on the landscape are, are much more subtle than, than earlier time periods. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons that we focus our um, <clears throat> research efforts and, and uh, preservation efforts on the Southwest, the connections so many groups are still here um, on this landscape. We can work uh, collaboratively with them to try to um, explore these um, questions. And um, oftentimes for the tribal groups, they're actually not questions. <laughs> they have um, pretty thorough explanations for them. Um, but let, let's let other folks uh, jump into the conversation here too. Debbie, you've been, you've been awfully patient. So the, the, um, when you look at, at our world and you look at how much of the world is covered by oceans and how much of the world is covered by ocean that previously was not covered by ocean, it's pretty astounding that we have this amazing font of knowledge that is, that is so uh, vaguely explored. Talk a little bit about the Institute of Nautical Archaeology. I mean, that is such a fascinating uh, group of people and there's so much rich history that we can still explore, isn't there? Thanks, Mark. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so I'm president of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, or INA, as we often call it. Uh, obviously, we're a lot smaller than the Archaeological Institute of America, but um, we specialize in shipwrecks. We excavate shipwrecks. 
And, um, you know, shipwrecks, I think, are are unique because they're a kind of time capsule. They are a snapshot on a historical timeline. And if you think of that timeline like a video, then these shipwrecks represent individual frozen moments in time. So many people will liken a shipwreck to uh, maybe, you know, as in, the, in a terrestrial context to a tomb or a site like Pompeii that was obviously buried in some catastrophic event. And in that sense, I think that's accurate that shipwrecks are like tombs, but they're different in the sense that they were dynamic, right? Because those ships were moving and everything on that ship was headed somewhere. Uh, shipwrecks are also, of course, accidents. They are what some archaeologists call unself-conscious formations, which basically <laughs> means that their number represents some percentage or some fraction of the whole. And it is fascinating to me to think about the fact that this discipline of nautical archaeology or shipwreck archaeology has really only been around for about 60 years. Ina was founded by Dr. George Bass, who is widely regarded as the father of underwater archaeology just 50 years ago. So it's astonishing to me and, and I think also very exciting to think about how much we've learned uh, just in the last half century and how much more there is out there to, to discover and excavate. And the techniques of nautical archaeology are so different because you're in a, an environment that is constantly moving, is very dynamic. It's one of those situations where, as you explore an archaeological site, you have to know that from the moment that you touch that site, that site is going to shift and change. Talk a little bit about how that informs your technique when you do approach an archaeological site that you are, that speed is absolutely of essence and there needs to be a compromise between speed and meticulousness that strikes the right balance so that you don't end up with a destroyed uh, site and you're gathering as much information as possible at, all at once. You know, the, you're right. The techniques are very different in underwater archaeology, but the goals are really the same. Um, our, our goal as nautical archaeologists, using the same principles that George Bass learned uh, on land and then sought to apply underwater, uh, are to excavate thoughtfully, carefully, systematically, and record everything and then publish what we find. So um, all archaeology is fundamentally destruction, and you can only excavate something once, so you better do it right. That's such a that's such a great point. All archaeology is fundamentally uh, destruction. Could you, Bill, and you, Letitia, comment on this idea of destruction? Because if you can only do it once, um, now sometimes you end up with materials that can be analyzed multiple times as technology involves. How do you ensure that what you're doing has the lightest possible touch and has the most consultation with those people involved? so that you end up with people who embrace your approach and welcome it back, as opposed to feeling offended by the approaches that you take as you as you do your destructive study. Well, there are two, two things that I would jump in, first of all, and say that um, your listeners may be really interested in Googling the Gozo shipwreck. Um, I was just in Malta this summer, and there's a big uh, nautical archaeology conference going on there right now. And the Gozo shipwreck, which is of a, a 7th century Phoenician ship, is actually changing how underwater archaeology is done because it's at a thousand feet below the, the top of the water. <laughs> um, and that's really deep. Um, and so the meticulous aspect that you were just talking about is even more complicated. But essentially what you need to do is be meticulous. You have to be very careful about everything that you do because other people may come along later and do different sort of studies. So a great example, since I was uh, leading a tour of Sicily this summer, um, recently in the New York Times about a month ago, there was a study about <clears throat> the skeletons from the site of Hymera H-I-M-E-R-A, um, where there was a major battle in 480 BCE um, between the Greeks and the Carth Greeks on the island of Sicily and uh, the Carthaginians. Well, David Reich, who's a geneticist at Harvard, um, had and his team have analyzed the, the DNA of 54 of the skeletons to discover um, from an excavation that happened a long time ago um, <clears throat> that these uh, soldiers were not Greek, 
their parents and their grandparents were not immigrants to the island of Sicily. They actually came from places like Latvia, Bulgaria and the Ukraine. Um, so we're learning about mercenary tr sort of travel um, in the ancient Greek world at the beginning of the fifth century. And that's because the um, material was very carefully preserved. Um, and another example is about the beginning of agriculture. One of my colleagues, Andrew Moore, um, is working on a site where um, it's very clear that by analyzing some of the, the dust that remains from the site, they have found animal dung particles that indicate they domesticated animals at the same time as the cultivation of grain. Now, generally people thought the two were separate, that the cultivation of cereals happened first and then the domestication of animals happened afterwards. Clearly not the case. This is radically changing our understanding of the beginnings um, of uh, civilization and, and basically settlements. Well, you can connect that to the fact that Herodotus actually wrote about Hymera. So you have now scientists who are looking at, at dung. Yes. Uh, they are looking at, at DNA. They are looking at then the whole idea of migrations and how uh, societies intersect. And you have a reconception of a story that was told, um, uh, uh, what was it, uh, uh, 2,500 years ago by um, by a Greek writer um, who became the prototype of the historian. Uh, Bill, you also have uh, a another issue in that when you're walking on a site, you are not necessarily equipped to recognize what is significant or not significant. There are so many subtleties that the, the very uh, track that you're walking on, you could be walking on something that uh, is actually part of an archaeological site. How do you approach that? It's a little bit different than what Debbie was talking about, but but that whole idea of of creative destruction and just walking can can be a an act of destruction. Um, how do you how do you approach that? So, yes, I mean, there's some of the landscapes out here are literally um, the footpaths that people trekked over in the past are still impressed into something called desert pavement. And you can, um, you don't want to walk over that or even worse, you don't want off-road vehicles driving over uh, places like that. And to, you know, extend back to your earlier question about, um, you know, the, the preservation strategies and how uh, excavation is destructive. Um, the, I mean, we, we, as our nonprofit, our focus on less and less on excavation and much more on, on protection, um, we recognize that most of the archaeology being done in the United States now is, is prior to construction projects and, and that sort of thing. So that um, we reuse and, and multiple times information from those kinds of sources. Um, and we actually try to work uh, as much as possible on the surface. We had this one example um, where I mentioned trails impressed into the ground. Um, there are landscapes out there where we've taken surveyors little pin flags and marked every single pottery um, bit that we could see on the landscape. And for about five kilometers, traced a trail across the landscape uh, simply uh, by tracing artifacts. And the exciting thing is that trail, the pottery on there goes back at least 1200 years and it connects to a uh, song cycle that the, uh, the folks on the Gila River Indian community, the Akimel Atam, um, still practice today, which uh, describes their treks across the, that. We just lost your. We just lost your sound bill. Um, but I, I uh, sorry, I whacked my. <laughs> I moved give us, my hand. Give us the punchline again, because that was yeah. really interesting. You you said that that the, the 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 trail of pottery connects to the song cycles. Yes. So so it's it's still a way in which the autumn people. Uh, you know, connect to their heritage by these songs. And this describes a, a trek across the landscape um, uh, that, again, goes back into deep time. And, and this archaeological trail uh, certainly seems to uh, connect with that as well. So 1,200 years at least of, of history 
connected to today um, and the traditions of the uh, autumn people here in Southern Arizona. Now you're all doing very, very basic research that later on will find its way into a more contextualized understanding of our world. And there'll be other storytellers who will take your research and, and connect it with research of others to create a, a, a wholesome a picture. How do you interact with people who then use your, your research, interpret your research? Because in many respects, while you're excavating knowledge from others, others are excavating knowledge from you and other sources to bring together uh, full stories. Um, how do you ensure that, that your knowledge gets out there? And secondly, when somebody is using your knowledge, how do you interact with, with those people, Debbie, um, who are then using your knowledge for other purposes? How do you ensure that that they're understanding it correctly? Great question, Mark. I think, um, you know, archaeology moves pretty slowly, um, both in terms of actual excavation and publication. So personally, my one of one of my um, I think you know most rewarding experiences as an archaeologist is to get out and give lectures. And the National Lecture Program of the AIA has been fantastic in that regard because um, you know the anal I mean especially in underwater archaeology where we're limited to you know if if we're lucky an hour a day on a, on a shipwreck site. I can't stand over my my excavation and study it the way a terrestrial archaeologist can. So. Our field moves huge very slowly. Prep, huge amount of prep and a little itty bitty time window in order to. That's do right, that. and you better be you better be pretty well organized. You know, you you better um, you better plan that dive and dive your plan, and then even when you get down to the seabed, sometimes there will be a big moray eel or something sitting in your grid square, and you just have to pivot and do something different. Um, but I think uh, just in terms of of outreach and sharing the results from the field. Um, one of the frustrations is simply that, you know, it takes a while in publication for that to happen. So I think uh, the public lectures and the national lecture programs and, and um, opportunities like this, frankly, are terrific for, um, for getting the word out about archeological finds and, and also the interpretations of the archeologist who excavates these sites. I mean, I think that has to merit, um, to, to carry more weight than someone reinterpreting it 30 or 40 or 50 years later. What I find to be so interesting is how you all not only share knowledge so freely because it's not done in other sectors, the business sector and so on are very often very proprietary about, about their knowledge because knowledge is tied to, to, uh, to wealth, to uh, profit. Uh, but not only do you share your, your knowledge, but you also welcome challenge sometimes welcoming challenge is tough, right? Because you've reached your conclusion. Somebody else says, no, 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 that's not the right conclusion. Um, how do you deal with that emotionally, Letitia, in terms of being challenged, having cultivated a theory, and then somebody else says, somebody you respect says, you know, maybe maybe not so much. I love it. I love it. I mean, I, I come from a, a family that that thrives on sort of controversial discussions. Um, I actually grew up in San Francisco. So for those people who are listening from the Bay Area, I say hi. I went to Lowell High School. Um, but I think that, um, you know, there are a couple of things and I, I can't resist because you actually introduced me as being from the AIA. It's based in Massachusetts. Well, we're all over the country, but our headquarters are in Massachusetts. Right. Um, I, I have to give an example that's very timely this month. OK, Thanksgiving. Right. Um, so we all know the story of the pilgrims um, and at Plymouth, what used to be called Plymouth Plantation. Well, the site now is called Patuck, Plymouth Patuxet because we are finding out through excavation on Barrel Hill in the modern town of Plymouth that actually the indigenous community of the Wampanoag and the pilgrims were much more closely linked than people thought. Um, and I have actually, we, we have this award-winning magazine, Archaeology Magazine, which I strongly recommend some of your readers actually look for. Um, and um, in it, I actually have a, a, a letter um, talking a little bit about um, that work. Um, it's changing the way history is written. Um, that's what archaeology does. Archaeology speaks when history is silent. How, um, how has it changed the way history is written? How, do, how has it changed that? Because we all know the history. We all have sort of the standard stories. And there were images, there were great paintings and so on. Uh, how has that changed the way history is written? 
Well, the example of Plymouth Patuxet is a perfect one. The idea that we all had with pilgrims sort of being in this little fortified compound and then periodically they would see the indigenous peoples on the outside is completely not right. Um, the idea that it's all the Greeks fighting, you know, for Sicily against the Carthaginians is not right. They were mercenaries, actually, who came from further away. But the Greeks don't want to stress that. You mentioned Herodotus. Um, and of course, they want to stress that this is, you know, the Greek civilization fighting against the Carthaginians. Um, so so archaeology opens up the perspective for, for other different, you know, viewpoints. And the indigenous one is a great one. The Clotilda, the last slave ship, or the last known slave ship is another example of how we're learning about um, uh, people who thwarted the uh, act against slavery um, in Alabama. Um, and I strongly recommend your readers actually look for the clotildastory.com if they're interested in that, and the Descendant movie that Netflix has just released a couple of weeks ago. Are you all saying that history, the reality of history is more complicated than the myths we tell about our history? Yes, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, um, a great point uh, you've made about interacting with texts, because this is something Letitia and I do a lot of working in the, in the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, Herodotus and, you know, accounts, I'm thinking of Pliny the Younger's account of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. We can read that account. We can learn from Pliny what it was like to be there. But when we excavate artifacts from that actual eruption, we have an opportunity to interrogate those artifacts in a way that we can't interrogate Pliny the Younger. So the artifacts basically open up a dialogue with the past that we can't always have with the texts. And it looked, and other people, in other words, it's not just the elites. We're looking at real people. Um, who exactly. lived and, and, and died at Pompeii and Herculaneum. Um, and that's something that's a different perspective, too, because it's not just the people who actually were wealthy enough to be able to spend the time writing, like Pliny the Elder um, or Herodotus. Or the seafarers who were so disrespected and disliked by many of the elites. And, and yeah. the stories that that were oral traditions that end up getting encoded in, in Homer's works, which actually come from an oral tradition, what you have as well, Bill, is you have these oral traditions, these oral stories that come from uh, diverse Native societies that then get connected, as you said, to things like pottery trails, right? That, that whole connection between these various stories that might have previously just been viewed as quaint uh, particularly by by whites and sort of quaint native uh, uh, stories. But all of a sudden, you're able through that connection to reveal that there is always uh, that, that there has been encoded information in those stories that we just were not aware of. We just walked right on by like we walked by those pottery, pottery shots without consciousness. Artifacts in the archaeological record are, are reflections of actual behavior, and we have better uh, tools all the time to understand the artifacts, their context, and 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 interpretation. So uh, we've got great resources to put a big, much bigger picture around history, documents, all those sorts of things that are of great value. But uh, it, we're an independent source of information, and adding tribal or indigenous views uh, even makes it richer. So uh, it's a great time to be an archeologist, I have to say. Now, we just had uh, three uh, different polls. Um, the, the one that I thought was really interesting was uh, the third poll. Uh, first of all, um, there was 100% uh, support for uh, communal funding, government funding for archaeological research, which is nice. Um, great, great. You know, it's 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 really important that we understand our past. But the the poll that I thought was really interesting, we we asked if archaeological research indicates that dearly held beliefs narratives might not be accurate. When should the new information be revealed and shared with others? And a hundred percent of the people said either as soon as possible, or after new ideas have been peer reviewed, um, and and and. and pretty much there's a consensus that there is some validity to them. But nobody said only after respected leaders in society feel that people can be trusted with the information. Um, I'm going to uh, give uh, you, uh, Letitia, and then uh, Deborah, I'm going to give you uh, uh, the last word. Nautical archaeology will have the last word on this show. So, uh, Letitia, in terms of... Um, of how we should view this idea of different stories and different perspectives, because there has been some 
real uh, sense that you want to have a particular story and not have it uh, challenged, particularly the whole critical race theory uh, debate that has gone on in this country. There are debates around um, different perspectives, um, native perspectives, LGBTQ perspectives, uh, uh, Latin Hispanic perspectives um, on history. How do you look at the at how we should tell our history as a country in a way that creates a real understanding of our history and binds us together? How do you see this? I think that one of the things that's really critical is teaching children to just to um, critically think about the sources of information that they get. Um, I think that's what this is all about, um, is basically being able to identify fake news um, and um, material that actually comes from a valid source. And we're doing this increasingly in high schools. I think we need to start doing it in elementary schools. Um, the AI is very interested in education. Um, and uh, so I think that that's critical because we're always going to be bombarded from different directions um, with different information. And sifting through that is basically being like an archaeologist, right? Um, we're actually, we have to be able to do that um, intellectually. And um, so that, that's my answer to that. And I know we're almost out of time, so I want to give Debbie a chance to have the last word. Well, is fake news, Debbie, also fake history? Um, in, in, in other words, if, we, if we're talking about fake, are we also talking about creating a historical consciousness that is fake, that is not based in reality? How do you see this? Yeah, I mean, I think fake news is fake history if it is internalized and accepted. Um, and I think Letitia is absolutely right that, um, you know, our challenge before us is really to do a better job of educating. One of the, the challenges that I have as a nautical archaeologist is educating people about the difference between archaeology and treasure hunting. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage people and my students to ask tough questions, ask about the motives of the people who are exploring these shipwrecks. What are they after? Do they represent a nonprofit or a for-profit uh, company? Uh, you know, of course, we want people to invest in, in archaeology uh, and, and the proper responsible recovery of the past because it is ultimately a non-renewable resource. So what you're saying is the gold in King Tut's uh, tomb is um, is not worth at all what a scrap of knowledge that can be elicited from uh, respectful um, uh, study of of that particular era in history. Aina is, is somewhat famous for excavating a late Bronze Age shipwreck off the southern coast of Turkey at a site called Ulubrun, and the the most um, intrinsically valuable artifact from that shipwreck excavation is a gold chalice. It is, archaeologically speaking, the least diagnostic because it has no parallels, it can't be sourced, and it doesn't tell us anything really about who was on that ship. So intrinsic value and, and intellectual, historical, educational value are really not necessarily the same thing. Bill, you want to weigh in? I, I, was, I was going to give, uh, give uh, um, uh, the nautical uh, archaeologist the last word, but uh, Bill, why don't we give uh, the... the uh, the person who is helping to uh, reveal some of the, these tribal histories, the last word as well. Well, again, I think the discoveries that I, as an archeologist might celebrate, um, we find, I mean, the, there was a, some recent uh, footprints in the Southwest that were dated that may be as old as 23,000 years. And that's a, a remarkable uh, find. It pushes the peopling of the new world potentially, um, you know, 8,000 uh, or more years earlier than expected. Um, tribal response to that was, we told you so. Um, we've known this for a long time. So again, the, the valuing, um, I mean, back to the fake news kinds of issues, yes, we have to be critical of what we get dished out by the media all the time. But uh, also being really sensitive to, in our intellectual endeavors, uh, the, the very diverse uh, kinds of values that you get brought to the kind of work that we do and uh, to be respectful and, and appreciative of the opportunities to do what we do. 
the and for your I, listeners, that's the White Sands discovery. If yeah. they want to, if they want to um, Google that, they'll get more information. And by the way, there's a great article about King Tut's the the his his daughters um, who were mummified in his tomb that we've recently discovered. So there's an article in Archaeology Magazine, the latest issue, I think, um, about that. If people want to know more about King Tut and what we're discovering archaeologically. As well as the fact that there might be a hidden chamber in the in the uh, in the back of the tomb. Yes. So yeah, there are all sorts of great things. Well, you are the storytellers. You are the people who provide the raw materials for revised stories and a better understanding of our world. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Your work, Dr. Letitia Lafollette, President of the Archaeological Institute of America. Bill Dolly, uh, President and CEO of Archaeology. Southwest, and Dr. Debbie Carlson, president of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology in Texas. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful, wonderful work that you and your colleagues are doing. And please thank your colleagues, thank your board members, thank your financial supporters, thank your volunteers. You are heroes and you enrich our lives. Thank you, Mark, for having us. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye now.